Well, friends, we are in a series um, that walks us through the book of Ephesians, um, which was a book that the Apostle Paul wrote. And um, we are going to be working our way through that this uh, winter and spring season. And um, I'm excited about it. Today is a unique um, is a unique passage of Scripture. Um, have you ever had somebody like just start talking and it's like they never put a period, a comma, or an exclamation point in and they just talked and they just went for like nine sentences with no grammatic expression and in the end you're like, what? Anybody ever have that? I had it um, just the other day, I think it was Thursday night with my youngest son, Ethan. Uh, we were driving and I said, you know, Biscuit, what do you think? What would be the coolest treehouse you could build with a Star Wars theme? I should have known when I said this how awesome my son was. But um, he took off. And two hours later, he was like, ah. and I was just like, what? Like, we had planets rotating around a red maple tree. We had, every, we had AT-AT walkers. We had all these different things. And I was like, where did this come from? He got so excited and so into it, he just dove in with all his might. And even days later, like, we'd be sitting there and be like, it was yesterday at lunch, he was, he was talking to me, he's like, you know, if we did the larger walker, and I was like, and here we go again, right? And I love the boy, and I love his imagination, and I love Star Wars. I have no problem being a nerd. I've done just fine. And, um, and I love Jedis, and so he and I were talking about, and he got so creative and so into it, he couldn't wait to tell me what was going on in here, and at times he lost the words and would make little sounds. You know, he'd be like, because <laughs> he was so wound up, he was so excited. I loved his eagerness, his enthusiasm to engage a topic really fearlessly. He gave out some terrible ideas, but we didn't dwell on them. In the end, we decided that we were going to build Echo Base from Empire Strikes Back, and he was talking about how the shield generator would actually work. And I was like, son, we're not rich. We're, we're kind of poor. you got to stop. Like, you know, I was like, we can't have Echo Base. But he was ready to go, right? He was going to dress Shadow, our dog, as a tauntaun, and ride him around the yard. It was going to be awesome. His imagination went wild because he found a topic he was passionate about. The Apostle Paul, this learned, scholarly, intelligent, passionate, wise guy, writes a book to the church in Ephesus. And in Ephesus 1, chapter 1, verses 3 to 14, he has an Ethan moment. He doesn't take a breath. In the Greek, the original writing of Ephesians, um, there is no grammatical, it's the world's best run-on sentence. Paul's like, I got to tell you something. Takes all the air in, just blah, blah, and lets it out. There is no grammar in the first 11, in the, those 11 verses. Paul just writes, no commas, periods, question marks. He's just going, and he's saying something, and it's excited, and it's kind of pulling you in. You can almost feel it if you read it with the tension at which you would hear it if he was speaking it. It rolls off the tongue. It feels alive, and it's proclaiming things that are deeper than we give them time for, and it's really calling out to a true identity in us. So I'm going to read it, and I'm going to do my best to read it and the way it was written. Now, first service I found out, I printed a different version of this text than was on the screen. So some people were confused. So I'm going to do my best to read it off the screen and keep pace. So follow along with me as we go. Blessed be the uh, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chooses us in him before the foundations of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has blessed us with in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he has lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purposes of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. 
In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory. (sighs) Like, you're like, oh, but we really didn't get to hear it. We didn't get to hear it. Can you take a minute with me and just imagine what it felt like in Paul's head? He was just like, yeah, bow, and like hits it. It just kind of swells up and goes. Why? Because what Paul's declaring in this and what we often miss is Paul in, in 3 through 14 actually lays out the identity of the people of God. He tells us who we are. He tells us who we are, and if we understood who we were, we would actually, I believe, take more seriously that to which we were called, which is Christ Jesus. So let's look today. Let's look today at what the church is, according to Paul. So the church is something, but what is it? What is it? What was Paul trying to say in Ephesians 1, 3 to 14? Paul was first of all saying that the church is blessed by God, and it's blessed by God not just like Bless you, my child. I mean, that's nice and all. But there's actually specifics to it, right? There's specifics to the blessing of God. First of all, we're chosen. That's huge. As a kid who moved um, a lot when I was younger, um, it was lame to go to a new school and then have the PE teacher or whatever do the schoolyard pick. And you're like, awesome, I get to be picked last. I'm the default player that nobody wants, and I just go to that team. You know, and if you were blessed to be as unathletic and have that happen to you, uh, I'm sorry, um, I I would often fight my way up the ladder to try to get picked a little sooner and and make social connections and do that. But it was always hard to be someone who wasn't chosen. I'll never forget when I went to back to public school in sixth grade and uh, and my buddy Joe Holcomb was there and and we were really tight and we were really good friends and um, what it was like to have an advocate in the school. Have you ever had it, maybe where you were at that schoolyard pick, and you're like, great, here I go, back into the abyss of unchosenness. You're sitting there, and all of a sudden, your best friend gets picked as a team captain, and hope, like the spring sun, rises in your heart. Yeah? Right? Maybe not. But I know this, when your best friend gets picked, what does it mean? Hey, Billy, who loves my mom's cookies, we're friends. You pick me, right? You look at me, you're like... Dude, I know I'm kind of bad at throwing, catching, walking, or generally looking around, but I'm on the team, right? Why? Because we're in relationship. You get this hope that you're going to be chosen, that you're going to be pulled in, that you're part of something by choice, not just yours, but someone else's. We in the church need to understand we were chosen by Jesus Christ. We were chosen, dearly loved, because he fashioned us in his image. In his image, male and female, he made us. And there was something in us, as broken and sinful as we were, that was worth choosing. And we need to hold on to that, and we need to not only believe it, but we need to live into it. We were chosen. In our brokenness, we were still selected. In our heredity of sin, where there was no hope, God looked in and saw fit to redeem us and love us because of the image he gave us. We were one, we were part of. God gave his image to us and he wanted to choose us. So he chose us in Christ Jesus. The second thing is, is there's adoption. Now we lose the, um, the fundamental weight of what it means to be adopted in what Paul's saying. Because it's not uncommon to us, but I I need you to understand in a culture such as Ephesus or the ancient Near East, what you would have found is a culture of slavery where people were product, people were chattel slavery, human beings were treated with less dignity than a good ox or a good donkey or whatever. They, They were less than. And you may choose someone to work for you and be beneficial to your system, but it's very different to adopt them. It's very different to adopt someone in a slave culture where in the slave culture, someone breaks down, you throw them away. But if sons or daughters or family break down, we pull them close, right? And we take care of them. See, adoption's a big deal. And the church is chosen 
and it's adopted. Again, I don't think we get the, the right image. So I want you to think, okay, picture me sitting in my office, stoically, of course, and um, phone rings. I pick it up, and it's one of the beef eaters from the Windsor, House of Windsor in England, the Royal House of Windsor, Buckingham Palace, Elizabeth, the Queen. They said, Eric, your day has come. Indeed, we, w- we would like you to be part of the family and come and have dinner and talk about And I'm like, oh, right. And I'd hang up the phone, and I'd book it over to England. I come through the gates. They open. They're a little squeaky. They'll get to it. They open up. I walk through His Royal Highness, Eric. Oh, you know, I do my thing. And then I sit down at the table, and they teach me how to eat with my fork turned over. Doesn't make sense. They're British. And they, and they pile the food on the back, and I learn to eat like them. I have a seat at the table. And then they confer on to me not only the privilege of being present, but the rank, the title, the influence, and the lineage of the royal house of Windsor. That is an unlikely happening. Wouldn't it? I mean, seriously. HRH, Eric, no. It'd be weird. His royal highness, I wouldn't know what to do. And nobody expects that I'll be adopted into the royal house of Windsor, do they? Because I've stood outside Buckingham Palace a number of times, and all I've gotten was stared at by a guy who wore a varmint on its head. Just stared at me like, you can come closer, but I will run holes through you, right? I'm not welcome in that inner circle. I am not in the House of Windsor chosen and given rank, influence, title, and the ability to bring to bear the authority and the majesty of the crown of the Empire of England onto anything. Right? But in Christ, we not only are chosen, we are adopted, and therefore we take on the name of Christian. We take on the identity of the Savior. We take on the the likeness of him who redeemed us. And in doing this, we live into our adoption because he chose us, and then he conferred onto us all of the living benefits of the very Son of God, the High King of Heaven. The church is blessed because it's chosen and adopted. The next thing we know is the church is in Christ. And that is a critical understanding that the church would be in Christ because Christ was cleft. He was cut open by the nails in his hands and feet and pierced by the sword and punctured by the thorns on his head. The church is in Christ. And I love the imagery of Christ taking us and hiding us in the wounds of his hand, his side, his feet, and his head. So when the glory of God passes by, he does not see us in our brokenness. He sees only his son, Jesus Christ. The church is in Christ. Make no mistake that if you're a Christian, you have been hidden in Christ so that his redemption would be for you all secure. So we understand this. Being in Christ means that we are redeemed. And being redeemed means this that some sort of compensation had to happen for the bad aspects in us. There's a negative that had to be counteracted. It had to be redeemed. And Christ on the cross by his blood and by his all-sufficient gift of his life has redeemed us from our brokenness. We are redeemed, but then we're also forgiven, which means you remove guilt and penalty from our life. We who deserved hell have not only been redeemed, we've been forgiven and we've been invited into eternal life. So we begin to live in this tension of what does it mean to be redeemed? It means that what flaws you have are not actually yours to own. They're Christ to redeem. Whatever isn't good enough by this world's standards of you is perfect in the eyes of God if we would let him redeem what is broken. It means that whatever sins bind us to our past and tell us who we are based on our own behavior, those are forgiven and washed away and we are hidden in Christ. We take on the very life of Christ and we begin to live in such a way that the life of Christ is exampled through us by our redemption and the forgiveness conferred upon us through our adoption and being chosen by Christ. The next thing we know is that we are sealed. According to Paul, we are sealed by the Holy Spirit. What does it mean to be sealed? What does it mean to um, be sealed for the inheritance? Right? It's not words we we often use here. I love the image of a signet ring. Um, 
You take wax, you drip it over uh, a letter, you drip wax over it, and you take a signet and you stamp it in, and you seal the letter closed with a signet. For me, it would be like if I had one, it would be a capital F for Folkers. You stamp it closed, and they know when they see that letter, it came from me, right? And you break the seal and open the letter. It means sealed. What does it mean to be sealed? What does it mean to be promised the Holy Spirit? See, here's where it really gets real for us. The church is marked by the Holy Spirit. The evidence, the mark, the visible sign and seal of God is the presence of the Holy Spirit in his church. And the Holy Spirit, as John, the Gospel of John 15 would say, is the Spirit of Christ. The Spirit that illuminates and reveals who Christ was and how we're able to become like him in our living. He is the comforter of his people. The Spirit of God is the mark, the sign, the evidence that salvation is real. One of the good ways to explain it is to say this. What if someone came to me and said, Eric, choose any lake in Michigan. I want to buy you a cottage. First of all, thank you very much. And um, and they said, we want to do this, but we're not going to do it for 10 years. Pick a lake. I'd say Big Twin Lake in Antrim County, Michigan, up north. Beautiful, about 90 feet deep, spring-fed, crystal clear waters. Yeah, oh, best lake. I love it. Pick a cottage in 10 years, it's yours. <gasps> Ooh. So I go and I pick it. And I've got this great thing set up. You know, I'm going to start saving for my boat. And I'm going to have a boat, and I'm going to tow around that lake and just be the loud, you know, happy redneck on the lake. And, and I'm going to have so much fun. But five years in, I'd get a little nervous and be like, we haven't talked in a while. And I was just kind of wondering, are we still good on the cottage thing? Because I'm going to tell you, it owns this, right? I really want it. I love the idea. Could I get a promissory note? Could I get something that says, hey, we're not just being really cruel? making a joke. Can you give me evidence that you intend to do this? Can you, a letter, a contract, can you have a lawyer call me? I don't care. Just let me know there's something that marks our promises as real. Give me something. In Christian faith, there is a mark and a seal set upon us that is the Holy Spirit, and it fills the Christian's life so that they begin to live not according to their own desires and passions, but by that which fuels the kingdom of God, the love of Christ for the lost in this world. I have been dealing with people in my life, personally over the last month, who are wrestling so vigorously over calling and identity that it's, for me, it's almost wonderfully comical to watch. Because I look at them and I'm like, oh, God's got a plan for you, and it's, oh, things are about to change. I get so happy. I love it. I love watching it. I love seeing them wrestle with it. I love seeing them saying, I don't know what it is that God wants, but I just, oh, I have never loved him like this. I want to respond to God. And these are adult grown men, women, and some children going, I don't know how, but I've got to follow him. And they're anxious. They make coffee nervous. They're just, they're just bound up. Why? Because the Spirit of God is compelling them to love Christ with everything they have. Because that's exactly what Christ did for us. And he's calling them to live differently, not out of human rules, but because they are marked and they are sealed and they are the very evidence of the promise of Christ come to life in our midst. I believe the church should be desperately uncomfortable in every day of our lives because the Holy Spirit is challenging us and moving us to be and live into the identity of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is a tall order for any human, but it's not a tall order for the Holy Spirit to sign, seal, and give evidence to Christ's presence in our life by his presence, the Spirit of Christ revealing Jesus through us. So, there's a translation that comes out of Eugene Peterson's uh, kind of transliteration of the, um, of the message. And he words Ephesians 1.11 like this. It is in Christ that we find out who we are and what we're living for. That's what I love. Because in Christ, I've met a number of people lately who are finding out who they are and realizing, oh my gosh, I've been living for all the wrong things. Something's got to change. I'm uncomfortable in my own skin. It is Christ. It is in Christ that we find out who we are and what we're living for. Let us not miss that it is in Christ 
that we find that out. It's not in church. It's not around Jesus. It's not near to theology, but I'm not quite sure. That's not where we find it. That's not where we find it. We find who we are and what we're supposed to be living for in Christ. So if you are in Christ, then truly, this should be a true statement. This should be something being lived out of your life. If you're not a Christian and you're in this room and you're like, great, I'm here and there's all these people who seem like they're in and I'm out, don't worry. Christ died for you as much as me and any other. If you want to know him, come down. Let's pray together. You can give your life to him and be hidden in the wounds of Christ as easily and beautifully as I was and all the others. This is a church that celebrates that there are people here who never grew up in church but want to come to know Jesus. So after the service, if you don't want to make a scene, just come down and see me. I'd love to pray with you. I would love to pray with you. I would love to see you come to know Christ and baptize you once and for all into the death of Christ so that your life can be lived in the power of the resurrected Christ. We need to understand that in Christ we find out who we are, not in that world. In Christ we find out what we're meant for, not in this place, but in him. So we as the church have to live with an angst and a draw and a magnetic pull towards the one where we find out who we are and what it's all about. So I'm going to ask, do you know that you're chosen? Do you know that you're chosen? You are the chosen of God. He, he chooses you, whether you've accepted him or not. And the invitation from Christ to every human is that you can come as you are and receive him. And be received into him. And you can be blessed. And you can be in Christ. And you can be marked and signed and sealed and living with purpose. By the power of God. Not by anything we can do. There is nothing we can do religiously to save your soul. But thanks be to God that Jesus Christ took care of all that on the cross. And we could live fully marked, blessed and in Christ. As the church turned loose recklessly and wildly on a world that doesn't know we have the answers. Pray with me. Lord Jesus Christ, we, we love you and we thank you. We love you and we thank you because you have chosen us. Thank you, God, that we in Christ we are loved, redeemed, and forgiven forever. And that Christ can live by his spirit in us. And he can make use of the, the mess that is us sometimes. You can make use at all times of the mess that is our life. And we confess that, Lord. So much of what we do has been mistaken or flawed by self-promotion, envy, deceit, slander. We, we make these mistakes, yet you still choose to use us because you have redeemed what is broken. You have forgiven what is sinful. And you have called us into you that we could be life and light in this world. So we confess today that our life springs only from you. Our true life springs only from the Lord Jesus Christ, in whom we live, in whom we move, and in whom we have our being. Come, Lord Jesus. Speak to us, challenge us, draw us to yourself, that we may become the children of God, living vibrantly in this world. Pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, this would be a great time to stand up and sing together. One thing um, for you. We have the online devotions that will lead you up to next week's sermon. If, if you would like to do those, they're online. But I know there's some of you who are like, no, I'm not going online and I'm not going to find it. And that's fine. We murdered a tree on your behalf. A dead tree is waiting for you. That's right. It's guilt. It's terrible and I shouldn't have used it. Um, so uh, we do have some of these devotions uh, set out for you. For if you'd like a paper copy, they're an awesome chance for you to do devotions individually, as a family, as a couple, what, whatever works. Please make use of these. They will get you primed and ready for the sermon upcoming next week. And hopefully when you join sermon-based small groups, we'll have a, uh, a study kind of jumping out of this. And you'll find yourself strangely familiar with the Word of God. So please make use of those. There's some at the back entrance or exit on your way out. You can grab or at the information table um, right up front across from the, the snack table here. I, I do want to close in a little bit of a unique way.
I want you to um, hear this before I give the benediction. I want you to hear and pay attention for the themes of the church being blessed, the church being in Christ, and the church being sealed. The word of the Lord from the Apostle Paul. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and his will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him, Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ, to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we who were the first to put our hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory, and you, also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession, to the praise of his glory. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, it is time for the church to leave the building. My friends, you're dismissed.